Welcome to the Latin American Perspectives Podcast. My name is Alexander Scott. I'm your host and a member of the Latin American Perspectives Editorial Collective, and I'm recording this podcast for you from Southern California. For today's episode, I met with LAP editors James Green and Tulio Ferreira to discuss their January 2023 issue of LAP, titled Brazil Under Bolsonaro, Social, Political, and Economic Impacts in the Country and in Latin America. For those of you interested in learning more about the current state of Brazilian politics, the far right, and neo-fascism in Brazil and Latin America, this episode is a must-listen. Tulio Ferreira is an associate professor of international relations at the Universidade Federal de Paraiba. James N. Green is Carlos Manuel de Cespedes, professor of modern Latin American history at Brown University. He is also president of the board of the Washington Brazil office and the national co-coordinator of the U.S. Network for Democracy in Brazil. James also hosts his own excellent podcast titled Brazil Unfiltered that is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many other listening apps. Now, let's get to the interview. James and Tulio, welcome to the Latin American Perspective Podcast. It's great to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Alex, and hi, Jim. James, would you describe the theme of this new issue of LAP and how it came about? And in particular, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the types of arguments or perceptions of the Brazilian far right that this issue seeks to reject or move beyond. Um, so soon after the election of Jair Bolsonaro, Tulio, who was a visiting scholar at Brown University, um, and I decided we wanted to do an issue for Latin America perspectives because this was a very significantly different kind of regime coming to power, very different from the dictatorship from 64 to 85 or more semi-authoritarian governments that were in power uh, after the impeachment of Jim Rousseff in 2016. And we wanted to start the process of people analyzing something that was in, in, in course, something that was happening at the moment. So therefore, uh, it's always tricky to ask people to be talking about contemporary things that are evolving over time. But we found a very wide array of articles that address all the different ways in which Bolsonaro's government affected Brazilian uh, society, uh, whether that was on public policy, international relations, the situation in education, the situation uh, in the countryside. It was a very broadly uh, conceived uh, uh, issue with many, many submissions, many more than we could actually publish because it was a lot of uh, intellectual curiosity by scholars, mostly Brazilians, who wanted to write about uh, the situation as it was unfolding in the country. Uh, did you want to add to that, uh, Tulio? <laughs> yeah, of, of course. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, yeah, I would say that we have uh, this interest to know how we could elect one low-rank captain from the army, the guy who was an expressive in politics here. And it was uh, the quest, the main question was how we arrived in this kind of situation in Brazil that for the first time we have this uh, such a, a group of people that could be elected. And so this was the main question we tried to answer uh, in this uh, special issue. And you, and you asked about, you know, what might be different about the way that traditionally Bolsonaro is understood. I think actually there's nothing surprisingly different in, the, in one sense, because um, there has been a broad consensus of how horrible he was as president, the worst president in the history of Brazil, definitively. And the fact that uh, Luis Inácio Lula da Silva could build in 2022, an electoral coalition, which was so broad, including his historical rivals in elections in the past, was an indication of a almost a national consensus in the country about how horrible uh, the Bolsonaro government was in all aspects and it need, the, the need for it to be defeated. And I think one kind of uh, symbolic uh, gesture was the fact that the traditionally conservative media conglomerate, uh, uh, Hedge Global, Global Networks, 
um, surprisingly, over the last year and a half, two years, shifted from being very ferociously against the left and against the Workers' Party, criticizing Lula, um, really shifted dramatically and was very vocal against the, the government of Bolsonaro and very critical of it and building a consensus in, among the people that follow the media about how bad he was as president. So uh, I think what is interesting is the depth of the articles and the way in which they go into detail about the kinds of policies carried out by the new government and the effect they had on Brazilian culture, society, uh, and and the people you know trying to survive within this context. Tulio, you already started to touch upon this, and I do I do want to get to the Bolsonaro government and the the tragedies that came out of that and how it was eventually defeated. But before we go further, uh, Tulio, could you provide some background information for our listeners on who? Jair Bolsonaro is and how he came to power. Hey, Jair Bolsonaro was uh, one uh, captain from the army, and during the seventies, uh, he was expelled from the army because he he like a uh, plan to explode some thing there in order to get a rise in the in the payment, <laughs> and uh, he was a bad uh, a bad military. I would say that, yeah. And uh, there were some documents showing that uh, he was judged and uh, expelled from the army, the, from the Brazilian army. And, uh, but also he, gov- he galvanized some uh, feelings uh, inside the army. Uh, and he went to the, into politics from the 80s and so. And he started this movement from there. Uh, he's, uh, from, he was originally from Sao Paulo, but he created his political career in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, he started his uh, to represent this uh, very conservative and authoritarian thing or thought uh, in the Brazilian army, and he galvanized this kind of people. And he was uh, he, and he started to be elected as uh, from the they start from the vereador is the is like a, re- a representative from the legislativo yeah here, uh, and from. Uh, from a representative uh, and deputado federal, estadual, and ho- so he spent a, a three decades defended this in the parliament. He was a like a, a, an expressive per, a person, but he galvanized those uh, deep roots of the conservative uh, political thought in Brazil. I would say uh, to the time that uh, he was uh, like. Uh, um, I don't know, he was chosen by this kind of uh, people to be uh, this uh, candidate of uh, the far right in Brazil, this uh, worldwide movement that was, uh, has been spreading. Uh, and so he, and he was successful in his uh, challenge or his uh, uh, candidate. Uh, I forgot how to say this, but he was successful in his challenge. It would be this, Jim, uh, in the, his candidacy. Or in his candidacy, thing, right. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's, it's important to understand several factors. So Bolsonaro actually was, uh, in a first appeal, was uh, sanctioned by the military. And then on appeal, it, it was overturned. But then he left the military. He was already running for office as a, as a city council person in Rio and um, used the base of support of retired military people and their families in Rio de Janeiro because it was the capital of the country uh, for almost 200 years and because it was a a pleasant environment to live in. A lot of retired military people uh, live in Rio and there's a large social base that he could rely on. Um, And he also galvanized the situation and polarized the situation in Brazil when Lula uh, was condemned for alleged corruption and therefore ineligible to run in the, in the 18 elections, uh, a, a space opened up, a space opened up to the right of the traditional opposition political party, the Party of Brazilian Social Democracy. Um, and the candidate of the Party of Brazilian Social Democracy, which had uh, uh, had candidates, uh, had the presidency of Fernando Cardoso and other candidates over the years, uh, was relatively weak uh, in this regard. In fact, uh, ironically, Uh, The person who was the candidate of the Party of Brazilian Social Democracy, Geraldo Alckmin, later was chosen by Lula to be his vice presidential candidate 
in the 2022, precisely to build this broad coalition. So Bolsonaro it was doing relatively well, but not significantly, as it was unclear whether Lula would be elected or not, or eligible to run the elections. And then in uh, the end of the campaign, someone attacked him and stabbed him, and he got tremendous sympathy. He was hospitalized. He didn't have to appear in the debates. And in that way, he built kind of a certain empathy by people and avoided the criticism uh, because he wasn't under the focus of the public during the last debates and therefore won the first round, uh, but not a, a majority. And then in the second round, uh, defeated Fernando Haddad, who currently is the minister of finance in the in the current government of Luis Inácio Lula da Silva. Uh, excuse me. Maybe it's, it's important to add that... Uh the role of the army in the Brazilian politics. And Bolsonaro would represent one of what we call here uh, the linha dura, yeah? one of the brand or the branches of the Brazilian army. It's a, a huge discussion, but I would say that the, the army has a special role in the Brazilian politics since the Republic, and Bolsonaro would be one of the representatives or one, of, uh, one person who represents the the most severe <laughs> conservative thoughts in this, uh, in this uh, political uh, thoughts here in Brazil. Yeah, even during the red democratization here, there was some struggle about it, we have explosions, and Bolsonaro would represent part of this uh, branch of, uh, of thoughts here. And even I think if we look at it historically, it goes all the way back to the formation of Brazil as an independent nation, which was in 1822, 1824, uh, constitution is approved, which includes a clause, a very strange thing called the moderating power, which in addition to the three branches of government, the executive, legislative, and judicial, a third, a fourth power was attributed to the emperor, which allowed him to intervene arbitrarily in any sector of the government to impose his will. Now, even though that clause of the constitution was not in the 1891 constitution when Brazil became a republic, the tradition that the military had acquired in the 19th century, repressing rebellions, regional rebellions, and overthrowing the regime of the empire in 1889, and then being involved in uh, politics in a direct way gave them a sense, the large sections of the military, that they had a right, a kind of almost a divine right, to interfere in politics, which led to uh, the, the two, the two decade military dictatorship from 1964 to 85, and this notion that the military were the saviors of the country. Bolsonaro took advantage of this sentiment, incentivized it, and appointed over 6,000 active members of the military to his government and all levels of the government in order to implement his policies and consolidate this arch conservative uh, perspective within the military. Now, there's a minority sector of the military which we can say is democratic in the sense that they understand that the role of the military should be to defend the borders, to uh, defend national security, to intervene if there's a calamity such as droughts or if there's a, a flood or some kind of natural disaster, but not to be directly involved in politics. But the majority of the military, even though they are currently uh, on the retreat, um, believe that. And that is the reason why after Lula was elected, his supporters started to immediately demand that the military come to power, that they intervene and overturn their election results. And that led uh, 10 days after, uh, eight days after Lula was inaugurated on January 1st, 2023, to the invasion of the Congress, the presidency, and the seat of the Supreme Court by several thousand Bolsonaro supporters who believed they had the right in the name of the army, in the name of their imagination of the constitution, the right to intercede and overturn the democratic election results. So even though um, our issue was written by people uh, and articles were approved before um, this uh, coup attempt uh, at the, after the elections, the sentiment, the, the sense, the feeling of what the last four years is reflected in these articles and all the aspects uh, of its influence on Brazilian uh, society uh, uh, over the last four years. And uh, I would add that uh, if you look at the, Bra the Brazilian uh, flag or here, you have one saying, ordem e progresso, who would say order and progress. It's a positivist district that reflects the 
role of the army at the when, as Jesus said, in the the coup d'état that was the Republicans here in the 1889. When we read Order and Progress, it remains nowadays in our constitution. Uh, I would say that uh, now we are discussing the Article 142 that represents this that Jean was explaining. If the if the army uh, are the the last uh, arbit or the last uh, point or the last uh, arbitral, how do you say the, the judge? Arbitral. Yeah. Arbitrary. So they, they are uh, that's. It's still written in our constitution uh, in this article one for two that they are trying to discuss if uh, the army has the right to intervene as a judge in cases when their uh, powers, uh, they, they, they could have a solution for us. So it's still and, there. And even though the, the majority of constitutional lawyers and experts understand that the the article does not entail this moderating power. It was, it was appropriated by the supporters of Bolsonaro in the attempted uh, coup d'etat. And uh, they, there, there is still is a notion, a strong notion among uh, a large minority of the country that the military should play this role. So it's a severe threat to democracy in the country. Beyond just the central role of the Brazilian mil military in politics, um, I would, I'm interested to to hear more about the political and ideological tenets of the Bolsonaro movement, Bolsonaro project, and also hear a little more about not just the history of militarism in the country, but also maybe the role of, of integralism and the religious right in uh, far right and authoritarian movements. Right. So if I can start, um, uh, after the establishment of the Republic, um, Brazil became a um, a country that separated church and state, and the Catholic Church retreated for a period of time. It had been relatively conservative, uh, and then it regained its support in the 1920s and 30s. Um, in, in this period of the 30s, the polarization between the left and right internationally, uh, there emerged in Brazil not only a small Nazi party based largely among German immigrants in the South, but also a party called the Intercalist Party, which had an ideology which was proto-fascist, although it had its variations because it had to res respond to several questions that were part of the reality of Brazil. One of them was it couldn't have the same racist ideas and ideologies that um, the, it, the fascist movement had in other countries because of the overwhelmingly large Afro-descendant population, although it was anti-Semitic in its content. And the integralist um, attempted to seize power in 1938. They were unsuccessful in doing that. Um, the military used this and the government of Jotulio Vargas used this attempt and others to, to, to uh, consolidate their power. Um, and if we look back at the course of the 20th century, we can say there have been nine military coup attempts, at least four of which we could argue were successful. Um, one in 1930, one in 1937, one in 1945, and one in 1964. And so the one that was attempted in January of 2023 was the fifth attempt to successfully um, seize power and control the state. Now, Bolsonaro's support is based on, I think, three significant areas. One is um, conservative ideology writ large, the military, the Catholic Church, traditional uh, ideas of the family, of the society. A second is evangelical Christians who have become a significantly large political force in the country, growing to now about 30% of the population. And they tend to be conservative, very small wing that is progressive or liberal. And they tend to be a, a, embracing all of the international questions about morality, homosexuality, feminism, all the reactions towards the uh, democratic changes that have occurred in the world in the last 60 years. And a third social base is one that encourages a kind of capitalism that is unfettered by the state or controlled by the state in any way, shape, or form. So uh, although the military in Brazil has traditionally supported uh, state-owned businesses because they think it's part of national defense, Bolsonaro was much more attuned to international far-right ideology, which encouraged a kind of unfettered capitalist development in the country. And finally, uh, supporting things such as the expansion of the use of arms, uh, trying to undermine a very important law that was kind of a gun control law that was established, trying to encourage ownership by individuals of, of guns. And in fact, there's been an explosion in the possession of firearms in Brazil in the last four years, leading to 
many kinds of violence against individuals, whether it's femicide uh, or uh, vigilante act actions by people or uh, racist fears of of the poor other and therefore using arms to to uh, invoke individual justice as opposed to allowing the, the just judicial system to do that. So this, this kind of co- coalition of forces was amplified finally by a strong anti-workers party, anti-Lula sentiment, which is complex and we can talk about that if you'd like, which really had embedded itself within a large percentage of the Brazilian population over the last six to eight years and therefore created a notion that Lula was not to be trusted, the Workers Party and the left were corrupt, and therefore we needed to have what was allegedly a moralistic, proper government in power led by the military with the ideas of discipline and order and morality that would make sure that the country would move forward with order and progress, as Tulio mentioned. I would add that uh, we used uh, one Brazilian author called uh, Alci Lenharu, who wrote this book, The Sacralization of Politics. It's a very important book here, trying to get sense of this deep roots of religion and uh, army in Brazil. So the connection of cross and gum, I would say this order, and uh, it's uh, it was like a blender of ideology here in Brazil. We have this integralist movement. It's, uh, I would say, uh, the leader uh, would be this Plinio Salgado person from the 30s, and they tried to create like to a tropical uh, fascism. Uh, they create uniforms and uh, they have salutes like Anawe with a Tupi word, but they at the sense they they like they join they put together uh, Catholic principles, anti-communist things, and they try to join this in one simple ideology that would carry on like those ideologies, uh, and so this embedded in some kind of the uh, of political thought in Brazil. It was very reminiscent, I would say, that we have uh, till today for uh, people from that time. One of those lawyers uh, that today represent one interpretation of this article would be descendant from no one, one, famous, one famous lawyer who took part in this movement. So the integralism, I, I think, and we have two articles very important, Tongues of Fire of Andrea Pagliolini. I, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing the word correctly, and another one from Boito, trying to, cap- to capture this sense of the fascism in Brazil. I would say the, that integralism is still, kind of it is, is still alive, and it's important to be uh, understood as a force, or as a, 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 one important line of, of political thought in Brazil. Many, many scholars and tourists and people who are interested in Latin America and Brazil fall in love with the country because it has a contradictory nature. On one part, it has carnival, it has celebration, it has beautiful music, it has dance, it has a a kind of a cultural uh, notion of uh, happiness and friendliness and openness. And it's all part of the culture of the society. But it also has another side, which is extremely conservative and reactionary, built on 350 years, almost 400 years of slavery, built on uh, a strongly Catholic uh, dominated country that um, participated in the genocide of the indigenous population, the enslavement of African uh, peoples uh, in plantations owned by the Jesuits, for example, and uh, a very strong sentiment of the family as a basic unit of society, reinforced to a certain extent by large European and Japanese immigration in the early 20th century, in which the family was a very important unit of survival, or those people who migrated from one part of the country to another and needed to rely on the family to survive because the state was relatively weak. And so the family as a conservative unit has been consolidated in recent years uh, and promoted by Bolsonaro and the far right as the mainstay of the country. And therefore anything that challenges that, whether it's feminism or LGBTQ ideas or uh, uh, the protagonism of new political forces is very threatening to this status quo. And so I think some people who don't really fully understand the complexity of Brazil get confused by the seemingly contradictory natures of the country and its culture. Uh, But they're both there and they're both very strong. And that's reflected in the fact that the elections were extremely polarized with 51% voting for Lula and 49% voting for Bolsonaro. 
I, I think we also have to take uh, into consideration that Brazil had the biggest Nazi party uh, outside Germany. It was because we have this history of, of South colonization from Germans, Italians, Japanese, as Jim said. It was in our history, the, this necessity of immigration. And so this kind of ideology uh, had some uh, ground here to prosper, I would say. So in, in our deepest roots, we have th this kind of conservative uh, people. And as Jean said, uh, maybe uh, for those who are trying to uh, understand the complexity of the Brazilian society, uh, it's, it's important to take this into consideration. And for, for that reason, I'm extremely excited for your issue because I think I, I myself, I'm working on a dissertation about the far right here domestically in the United States among uh, white and Latino communities. And I, I really appreciate the, the centering of historic far right and fascist movements in Brazil because I think here in the United States, Often people are just ignorant or unaware of the serious history of the far right and fascism throughout Latin America, actually, that just kind of is people just overlook here or don't know about. So I, I really appreciate that. But also that you're coupling that historical analysis with also a serious theoret a, a serious critical theoretical uh, dive into the far right that I think a lot of the contemporary social science doesn't do here, at least in the United States, when people are examining Trump or Brexit in Europe, things like that. So I really appreciate that about what you're doing with this issue, and I can't wait to read all the essays. Now, I do want to talk about what occurred under the Bolsonaro government. So um, I'm not sure which of you would like to go first, but um, what sorts of policies and programs were implemented or attempted under the Bolsonaro regime? And what have been the outcomes and tragedies of his presidency? So I think the first thing we can look at is the way in which um, Bolsonaro immediately began to dismantle all social programs and, and ideas that were developed over the last uh, 14 years by the left, and even before that by the Party of Brazilian Social Democracy, and emphasized um, uh, defunding of education, defunding of social programs, defunding of all attempts to eliminate social inequality, including trying to diminish the affirmative action programs that had existed. They did this indirectly by cutting up of funds so that e even if Afro-descended and indigenous people could get into the university through a quota system that was approved uh, in, in recent years under the Workers' Party governments, they received no additional funding. And so therefore, they had no way to get to school. They had no way to eat at lunchtime. They had no way to buy a computer after COVID happened. So that's the first thing. It was a real attack on universities and education in the country. And the second most dramatic one, uh, and I think this is an example of the ways in which Bolsonaro copied and was very much deferential to Donald Trump, was COVID-19. Because over 700,000 people died of COVID, probably probably close to a million people. We don't really have the exact accurate statistics because they stopped collecting the information because they didn't like the results and, of them. But they're all of the same things that Trump did. Denialism, d diminishing the use of the vaccines, not doing anything possible to, to fund uh, the excellent programs in Brazil, which could have developed the vaccines. Uh, at one point, wheeling and dealing to get extra kickback money for vaccines that were developed. Uh, which was it didn't happen, but it was an attempt to happen by supporters of his government, and and really not taking seriously this tremendously important uh, uh, human um, public health crisis that occurred in Brazil uh, in twenty twenty one and, tw and into twenty two, and so that alone uh, would be justified. And this became more dramatic recently after Lula became president when it was discovered that. Because Bolsonaro was in favor of illegal mining and logging to develop the Amazon for profit and for interest, he encouraged an increase in mining in indigenous territories that had been blocked off by the federal government for indigenous peoples, allowed thousands of miners to enter this territory and to do illegal mining and illegal logging. And as a result of that, polluting the rivers, um, 
siphoning off even malaria and other medicines that were supposed to be de dedicated to indigenous populations. And there was a human tragedy that was revealed soon after Lula was elected with the Yan Yanomami people who were really in abject poverty and, and mal uh, mal uh, nutrition and poorly treated because of the policies of the Bolsonaro government. What's been important, and it's really important to do the contrast, is that when Lula came to power, he made a series of promises during the election that he's kept. One of them was to establish for the first time in the history of Brazil, a ministry of indigenous people, or as they say in Brazil, original peoples. Uh, he appointed uh, an indigenous woman, Sonia, uh, um, um, Sonia um, Guajajara, to be uh, the minister. Uh, the person who was in charge of uh, the indigenous foundation of the government overseeing the indigenous people, specifically Funai, was also the, the head of that is also an indigenous woman. And he also appointed in the Ministry of Racial Equality the sister of the slain councilwoman, Marielle Franco, that people know about because she was killed in March of 2020. 2018, excuse me, uh, probably by sectors of the militia in Rio de Janeiro for her denunciation of the way the militias were interfering in poor communities. And her sister, Aniele Franco, uh, has been appointed the Minister of Racial Equality to kind of continue the legacy that her sister developed fighting for racial equality in the country and, and kind of overcoming the institutional racism, which is embedded in the legacy of slavery in the country. So these are examples of things that were negative that Bolsonaro did and things that have been uh, addressed uh, in the last two months uh, since uh, Luis Inácio Lula da Silva took power on January 1st, 2023. I would just add in our foreign policy, how this, uh, this far right agenda uh, arrived in our far, uh, far foreign policy. Uh, and so how would you, we, we explain the actions that Brazil took as Ernesto Araújo our first uh, chancellor uh, or uh, minister of international relations, he uh, took some uh, ideologies from the far right and uh, this guru called Olavo de Carvalho, a very conservative uh, guy who is now deceased, but uh, he, he used it to live it in the US and he has and defend kind of ideas like uh, the West is in danger. So we need to be careful with those uh, Chinese people, with uh, the, the uh, Muslims. And so they took this inside of Brazilian foreign policy and tried to align to the US, but more than the US, more to the Trump idea of uh, America first. Uh, it would, I, I would say that it was some kind of a uh, here, or we would say that uh, uh, Bolsonaro was Trump from the tropics. And I would say that Ernesto Araújo kind of uh, used this kind of ideology to uh, turn Brazil into an a pariah in the international system uh, and make uh, making some connections that were not so uh, like uh, it was uh, important or not respecting some of our uh, his historical roots in our foreign policy, multilateralism and some kind of universalism in our uh, foreign policy. So this would be one important uh, politic that was changed and now is being put in course again or in our historical roots course, I would say. I think there's an, another important element that we need to think about uh, having to do with actually the origins of Latin American Perspectives. Latin American Perspectives was founded in 1974 after the coup in Chile, and it was founded by academics, people like Ron Chilcoth and uh, Marjorie and Don Bray and Dan Bollinger, um, who were very engaged in offering solidarity with Latin America in this crucial moment in the 1970s. And in fact, Tulio and I were part of a movement after Bolsonaro and I was elected to have a national meeting, the U.S. network uh, in at Columbia Law School on December 1st, uh, 2018, to found the U.S. network for democracy in Brazil, which mobilized the, over the last four years, academics and Brazilians living in the United States in defense of democracy in Brazil. And in that first founding meeting at the Columbia Law School, we decided to establish an office in Washington, D.C., which is now called the Washington Brazil office, to actually do advocacy work within the Congress to establish relations with social movements in Brazil who are looking for international articulations of their movements, and also to establish a think tank to think more clearly about 
appropriate policies for Brazil, better relations between Brazil and the United States, and the ways in which progressive ideas can can, can flourish uh, in the U.S. about Brazil and in Brazil. And one of the things that we did most significantly this last year was to organize a contingent of 20 uh, so, uh, social movement organizations who went to Washington, D.C. in July of 2022 to talk to members of Congress, to talk to representatives of the White House, to talk to people in the State Department and the OAS about the dangers for democracy that were represented by Bolsonaro, the threat of a military coup, and calling on the U.S. government not to recognize Bolsonaro should their coup be happen, to discourage or to oppose any attempts by the military to take power and to recognize the results of the elections. Because just like Trump, Bolsonaro denied um, the validity of the electric ballot boxes that exist in Brazil, which are extremely efficient, much more efficient than the United States. He claimed that there was possible fraud and essentially inferred afterward that the elections had been stolen, which is one of the ways he mobilized his base of support to invade um, the capital in Brasilia on January 8th, much like two years and two days previously, uh, the far right uh, invaded the capital to try to overturn the US elections. So we see these similarities between the two countries and their policies, uh, even going down to the details of organizing similar kinds of insurrections in order to uh, to remain in power. Now, I know we're, we're short on time, but I did I did want to get to this question before you have to leave, James. And maybe, uh, Tulu, if you want to stick around for a little longer, we could talk a little more. But you, you, we have acknowledged that B Bolsonaro was defeated in the, the fall 2022 election by Lula. And I'm curious how this defeat has affected the far right in Brazil and uh, like really what's what's the current status of the far right? Let me jump in first because I do have to leave. Um, so there are three elements I think we can talk about. One is that the country is still very polarized as is the United States. I think these analogies are very appropriate. Um, Bolsonaro and his supporters were very successful in winning large numbers of seats in the House and the Senate in Brazil. So they have a, a minority block, but it's a significant minority block. And in the past, when Bolsonaro was was president, he managed to win over many of the centrist parties and the right-wing parties to his side. Some of them are currently supporting Lula, but they're not loyal supporters of this democratic coalition that Lula has established. And so Lula faces a serious problem of guaranteeing a minority, a majority, or even a 60%, which is necessary to pass constitutional amendments in the Congress. And he really has to find ways to build alliances with people who don't necessarily share his program in order to do that. But I think even more recently, and this is kind of hot off the press to a certain extent of the last week, it was revealed that uh, Bolsonaro received um, a gift from the, uh, Saudi Arabia worth $3.5 million in diamonds and other gifts that was given to him and to his wife. They were smuggled into the country. The diamonds were smuggled in the country, but um, the, the, um, the people at the customs discovered them in a backpack of an assistant to the Minister of Mines and Energy and seized them and tried to clarify the origins of these diamonds, these diamond necklaces and earrings and brooches, and try to understand this. And so I think that Bolsonaro is now claiming innocence, not knowing anything about this, but it's really an indication of his deep corruption, the way he was involved and his family were involved in using the state for personal benefit. And I think this will weaken a sector of people who voted for Bolsonaro, not necessarily because they believed him, but they didn't want to vote for Lula. There's another hardcore, which I would estimate is 20 to 25 percent, which is solidly uh, Bolsonaro supporters. And I'm not sure they're going to go away anytime soon. I think Brazil is really condemned as the United States for having to deal with the far right, which has international articulations, which has strong support in Congress, which has fanatical supporters among the population and have a very reactionary political policy or political orientation, which is still at bent on trying to overcome and overturn all of the democratic victories that Brazil has achieved since the process of democratization in the late 70s. And I gotta go. Well, thank, thank you, thank you so much, James. Bye, Jim. Bye. I'm sorry, my English is not so good, but I'm, I was trying to express. It was a very special thing because I was uh, as a visiting scholar to the U.S. Uh, we had this uh, 
When I was there, uh, Bolsonaro was elected. My field of research is Brazilian foreign policy and uh, also media as an actor in international relations. I was doing this research there. And uh, I was at the, the Watson Institute, yeah. And so we were trying oh, to okay. make sense of this, what was happening there. And my, my research was more like uh, how this, uh, this uh, media or this kind of uh, information that was built and the, uh, this, all these new, uh, new kind of communications would impact here worldwide, but here, specifically here in Brazil, how our media groups would, uh, would uh, uh, reverberate those kind of ideas here. We have a very uh, complex, I would say, but very patrimonial uh, groups of media here in Brazil. They, they, they belong to families. They have properties of different kind of, uh, of a means of media here. And uh, they, they uh, almost always represent those kind of voices. And I would uh, add in the sense of the far right agenda here that we, we, Brazil uh, was part of a process of criminalization of politics here. So Bolsonaro uh, took advantage of this because we criminalized the, the politicians and the politics in the, as a whole. And the Brazilian uh, uh, people got sick of this, oh, corruption, this is all, politics is bad. And the, it was reverberated in our media and uh, I would say the mainstream media. So it, it was a very complex situation around here. We have this operation... Uh, called Lava Jato. I, I don't know if you'll, yeah, the Lava Jato operation that uh, uh, it contributes to, to put a PT, the PT party, uh, into, the, into the, how do you say, the, in, into the defensive, I would say, uh, because they start to criminalize important people there. Like, and they even took Lula in jail, in jail, yeah? And so it was... Uh, those those movements created a, a, a very important ground here to make Bolsonaro arise. But Bolsonaro, I would say, it's the it's not the he, he's just a tiny fraction of it of, of the far right. He's just was what we call here un cavallo selado. It, it was the opportunity that we have uh, here. It uh, he uh, he managed to represent. Uh, very deep uh, roots of our feelings here. And now we have this uh, evangelical people. Of course, even it, it's a very complex. There are very competent and important Brazilian uh, author here trying to make sense of what the evangelical, the neo-Pentecostal movement here represents to our politics. If you, if you see the images when they invade uh, in the, as Jim was telling us in January 8th, uh, when they invade the Congress, there was like a mass there, a mass and a mass, like they were praying, yeah, they were praying, they were saying a chance of uh, Catholic or this. It was amazing. The images, it was like a, 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 a war, how I would say, it's like a, a, uma guerra santa. I would, it, it represents this kind of a war, an uh, evangelical war, like they, were bring, uh, they would bring uh, some uh, healing to a, a sick uh, country. You know what I mean? It was very important to take, uh, to take uh, it to this kind of thing into account. That's why it's so complex. The authoritarian thought, that, that, that's why I love this Alci Lenharu's work, uh, that, Sacralização da Política, he was very, in the 80s, he was taking, oh, it was happening here in Brazil. And now it's almost alive, this movement, yeah? There was so much in that that I could could jump on. I, okay, first point that I think is really important is, that I agree with is, yes, Bolsonaro is the face of this movement. He is the, the person who was the, the presidential candidate and the president, but he is only just one part of the larger far-right movement in Brazil and the international movement. I think it, I, I'll speak here to the context politically and intellectually within the United States, but I think we have a tendency here to focus on these great men of history, these these 
very powerful, prolific individuals and center them in these movements. You see it a lot in the discourse on the, the liberal left or the moderate left here in the United States where everybody wants to talk about Trump, but nobody wants to talk about the larger structural and sociocultural factors that have caused him, that caused him to ascend to the presidency. And I think it's very similar in Brazil, right? And so that's why among the many things I appreciate what you're doing with this issue is that you do center that this serious analysis of history and a serious analysis of the political, economic, and sociocultural factors that are contributing to this. Because the, these sorts of things aren't happening in isolation in Brazil, but it's actually a global phenomenon. And I, I'm a, some would call maybe a crude, a crude materialist or a Marxist, but um, I think a lot of it has to do with the crisis of, of capital accumulation and the crisis of the larger political economy and how that's influencing these, in my view, rather terrifying sociocultural movements that are coming out like, uh, like evangelism and um, extreme right wing, almost like an anti enlightenment backlash. In, in your introduction, uh, you, you and James, you highlight in particular something I thought was really interesting was you highlight this, uh, this issue of what was it, rationalism uh, and this discourse on rationality and political ideology in Brazil. Could you share some thoughts on that? Okay, I'm going to try to explain this uh, in English. <laughs> That's me. Because I, 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 we, we have this author here. Uh, it, it was a, actually he was a diplomat uh, called uh, Rouanet, and uh, he was a culture minister here in the, 80, uh, in the 90s. But in the 80s, uh, he wasn't one specialist. Uh, he was a friend of Habermas. Uh, the German philosopher, and uh, he tr they translated here in Brazil the, his, uh, his work, and he wrote this book called uh, something about the Illuminism, the Rationalism. And uh, he was, uh, in the 80s, he was, uh, he was uh, building this argument that in Brazil, we were creating uh, one way to... to revolution or, or to change things here in the democratization period, but not through means of rationalism, of to bring rationality or something, but in, on the other way around, they were trying to, they, they were uh, create some anchor uh, in the irrational side of the thing. And it's, it's amazing because they were uh, criticizing things like, uh, oh, the imperialism, saying that maybe uh, Ba is causing us damage and not the media inside Brazil that we have uh, like trash programs here. Oh, just because it's national, it's good. And so this kind of enlightenment thing of rationality were being destroyed here in Brazil in many fields. Yeah, and so he tried to, to make sense of this. And when I read this, I was uh, reading this text and it was so uh, connected with uh, some kind of thought that I, I, I found in Araújo's or Olavo de Carvalho that was some kind of uh, the, deep, uh, the deep ground or the, the roots underneath some kind of this political thought. Because they, they were not just conservative, they are reactionaries. Because they, they want not rationality, they, they bring us to another field of thought. So in this sense, I would say that this kind of discourse, they bring us not to the rationality, but to mingle again, like some, uh, some flavor or, of uh, spir spiritualities and uh, uh, religion. And so it would be like we returning to a movement pre-enlightenment movement. And so when I read this, I said, oh, it's important to discuss this kind of irrationality in politics now in Brazil, because we because we face um, educational problems. It's important to say that Brazil, when you say about media, it's important to say you have a centrality of TV here in Brazil. It's it's tragic. It's tragic because when you see the numbers of uh, illiteracy, it, it's getting better. But the, I would say the formal education, all those all those uh, uh, kinds of uh, numbers are that represents all 
some social challenges that we have here in Brazil. So irrationality in a more philosophical uh, sense, I would say that we, it would be connected to this worldwide far right movement because we, we bring back like some of these feelings of the, like uh, Araujo would like to emphasize that uh, like Spengler, said in the beginning of the 20th century that the West is in danger, that the, or, or, or the, the values of the West, uh, but not in the sense that uh, we, we need to, to bring back some kind of uh, uh, enlightenment so thoughts, but on the contrary, just to be reactionary, not to be inclusive, not, you know what I mean? So it was important to, to bring it into our society to say, oh, what we, and also in the political parties uh, in different fields in, in Brazil. And so that in this sense, I would say that this discussion that, of course, I'm, I'm not a, philo a philosopher to, to, to put it deeper than this, but the, 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 this discussion that uh, this text that we used in our introduction, I, 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 we would uh, consider that it's important to, to rescue this debate there, to say, oh, what is happening now? We have some sort of uh, irrationality in the sense that we are not uh, bring politics to this field of, uh, of, of, of a politics field, I would say, that people of difference, that we, we would create institutions, that we can respect this kind of differences of uh, political thought. No, now politics means we have an enemy to be defeated. So this is like a one uh, pre-modern thought, I would say. Yeah, in this sense, I would say that as a... Yeah, I agree with everything you're saying. And um, it really, everything you just said, it really points to the dialectical nature of, of politics, right? You can't separate philosophical, this philosophical, the intellectual from the political or the economic, right? Or the social. Um, it's part of a larger organic pro social process that's happening. And um, this is why I really try to stress to my students, especially in classes of like theory, I'm a sociologist, so, so social theory or philosophy, that this isn't just a bunch of old, usually men, usually European men, <laughs> but old men uh, just talking for the hell of it. This is this is actually part, this, this informs social movements. This is part of like a larger intellectual battle that's going on at the global level when you're reading people like um like this uh, theorist you're talking about i mean i'm not familiar with him but i'm now i'm going to be i'm going to look into this guy but it reminds me of like julius evola's work who was a fascist theorist of the uh, the mid 20th century post-world war ii right or or other other uh, right-wing ideologues right so i don't i just Everything you just said I find really, really, really interesting and important. And it also points to when you have that historical understanding and that the philosophical understanding of these movements, it points to, I think a lot of people are maybe uncomfortable with calling these movements fascist, but if you can contextualize it and understand it in that way, all right, maybe we haven't seen a full-blown fascist like government takeover in in brazil or other countries that are experiencing far-right movements but there's there's serious tendencies <laughs> there's a serious continuity here when you look at the history and the ideas and it, it's not it's not crazy to say fascist to call these these tendencies fascists i agree totally indeed it's i agree totally with you and that's why we selected the first article to be one of very prestigious academic here in Brazil, Boito, who to brings this kind of reflection. Of course, historically, fascism is there at that time, but as you said, I agree totally that uh, we have, uh, we have uh, permanence, I would say, remain some kind of, we have uh, things that uh, like resemblances. Of course, we can name it on other things, but of it's, uh, it's uh, there are some, uh, I would say some things, uh, the word is missing here, but there are some uh, uh, 
uh, as aspects of fascism that it's undeniable, undeniable things that we saw there at the time historical that when it was the time yeah, when, when, when it was created. But here now we are experiencing uh, we are experiencing things that resembles. Yes, it's important to say that that. Of course, it's a theoretical debate. Uh, I'm not qualified to do this in, in a deep sense, but Boito tried to do that. And, and it's the first article I, I, I think is a good one. Yeah. And uh, he brings us to this kind of, uh, uh, of debate. And also, Alex, if you, if you allow me, I would like to, to, to just to tell you two things. One, it's important to say about our political system here in Brazil. It's also very, very complicated because we have many, many parties, political parties. It's, it's, a, it's a chaos. Yeah, it's completely, it's a disaster, I would say, because we have political parties that they don't have uh, like a programs in itself. They, they just are like a, to be rent, <laughs> I would say. So we have the Centrão here. It's a, it's a political force that, they were with supporting Bolsonaro at the Congress, and maybe they are going to support Lula now. They are very pragmatic. They don't have political ideology in this. Of course, they have political ideolo ideologies, but they are, they are more uh, like, uh, I would say, pragmatic. They were, they were not so strict in the sense that you have a program that they, they, like a, a political part would defend. Thing. No, they are always trying to be pragmatic in order to get what they want and they almost always they represent parts of the Brazilian society that are more integrated in the sense to be more conservative. They have power, political power, economic power, they have this agro-business power and evangelical power. The, you know what I mean? So this is important to say because you have roots in order to explain the Brazilian political system at, uh, I, I mean, we have roots to, uh, to understand what is happening here. We have to be, a, I, I would say that we need a, a political reform, urgent, a, a urgent political reform in order to, and other things, in the other point, I would say that the, the nationalism is another point important to be discussed here because our model of development uh, and from the Portuguese colonization period, we have a, a, a series of debates here about patrimonialism to who the state, uh, who is inside the state here, who is represented in the state. We have a, it, it's a huge discussion, but we have a, a gap of representation here. Now it's getting better, of course, from the, the in 85, you have the redemocratization. Here, you have another constitution in 88. And of course, we are bringing people or groups that were uh, silenced. We are bringing those groups inside politics. It's getting better, but it's a process. It's, we, are, we, we, we have backlashes, as you said, about we have people or groups of interest that are losing power, are, are, are backlashing or are reacting to, to this movement. So it's important to say that those discourses, uh, those political ideologies, the conservative or the, the anti-communism things that like a, a cold war uh, and, and like a, an old cold war feelings here. Oh, here, it's amazing, Alex. People are using arguments like, oh, communism is arriving like a ghost. Gosh, what is happening? Say, oh, we are the 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 conjecture is completely different, and we are using ideas from four or five decades, and we live. I see. It's amazing to say this now, but it's amazing to be here living in this kind of uh, of, of situation. The people using this kind of argument, come red and Venezuela, so. They create ghosts, I would say, in order to advance some political uh, interests here. That's, a, I would say, those important facts. I think those are very important facts. And those also point to the real value and importance of the work that people like you and James are doing and, uh, and other Brazilian intellectuals. Um, 
as a scholar based here in the United States who's really interested in these types of topics, I really in the past year I've become really inspired and influenced by all of the amazing work, intellectual work that's coming out of of Brazil on this topic. I think it's really uh, for our listeners who are interested in this topic, I really think the work that's coming out of the out of Brazil is the cutting edge and is is in the right place on this issue. So I really appreciate you making the time to come and talk with me, and uh, I can't wait for this issue to be out in its full entirety online and in print. And I I just can't wait. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. That is all the time we have for today, but thank you for listening in. The new January 2023 issue of Latin American Perspectives can be accessed at latinamericanperspectives.com or via Sage Publishing. Check the show notes for links to where you can access a copy and where you can find more information about how to get in touch with Tulio and James or myself. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out James's Brazil Unfiltered podcast that is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many other listening apps. I have posted a link in the show notes for where you can find his podcast. If you would like to receive updates about Latin American news, current events, and content from our journal, please don't forget to follow us on any or all of our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And please don't forget to follow and rate our podcast on your preferred podcast listening app. We have a lot of new episodes planned for 2023, and we appreciate any help you can provide in promoting and building our show. Until next time. Gracias por escuchar. Thank you.